Trey, Kristen Dumay, Jamar Tisby, Russell Moore. Come Why are you still a Christian? This is Phil. The last five or six years have been rough for many thoughtful, faithful Christians. The embrace of Trump and Trumpism, the rise of ethnic nationalism and xenophobia, conspiracy theories and abuse scandals have rocked the church. Many have walked away in disgust. Some have spoken out and paid the price, and yet rather than walking away have remained committed to Christ and his church. We wanted to sit down with a few of those who have cried out like voices in the wilderness, who've been attacked by the church they love and yet still remain. We wanted to ask a simple question. Why are you still a Christian? Kristen DeMay is a New York Times bestselling author and professor of history at Calvin University. Her book, Jesus and John Wayne, made headlines by examining how toxic masculinity and misogyny within white evangelicalism has affected American history and culture. The reaction to Dumay's book within white evangelicalism was swift and ugly. Skye sat down with Kristen Dumay to hear her story and find out why, through it all, she's still following Jesus. Kristen Cobes Dumay, welcome back. Thanks for having me. I always love having you on the show. You're oh, so I fun to it. talk to. Um, you're helping us launch this new set of conversations we're having and it's going to be the same set of questions for all the guests that come on and the first one is pretty obvious so let's just start right there Kristen why are you still a Christian okay Sky I have to let you know that I'm only doing this for you <laughs> okay and and your holy post folks because uh it, it's honestly kind of weird for me as a historian to be invited into spaces where I am asked to give a personal testimony. Um, I'm not that kind of evangelical. If I'm evangelical at all, I'm really not evangelical, right? I'm, I'm reformed, Dutch reformed. We don't do this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> We're very reserved. <laughs> okay. Well, then why are you still Dutch reformed? <laughs> yeah, as long as they'll have me, right? Um, so so anyway, yeah, I don't, I don't usually lead with my faith, but when I write about Christianity, I'm, I'm asked to talk about it a lot. And so here goes. Um, why am I still a Christian? Uh, you know, I, I don't even know. I, uh, <laughs> in, um, it's, it's where I belong. It's, it's, uh, again, Calvinist here. Uh, I don't see it necessarily as a matter of choice. <laughs> You're just much. destined, predestined, I should say. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you just can't take the Christian out of me somehow. Um, I, you know, I I've definitely have moments uh, in my life where I questioned, and it's, actually, I haven't haven't talked about this at all before. But I was reading uh, Beth Moore's um, uh, memoir recently, mm -hmm. "All My Knotted Up Life," and there's one story there that was a little jarring. It was a story where she she kind of talks about she was at this summer camp, I think, and she was at the sink and she just had this like profound religious experience and she didn't really know what it was. And then she that really went on and, and put her life on that kind of trajectory. And um and there was nothing in her tradition that kind of set her up for for that. And and she had to make sense of it. And I mean I had a similar experience uh in a dorm uh, in Texas when I was in graduate school. And I think at that time I had, I had been studying, you know, women's history, gender studies, feminism, and, uh, uh, and American evangelicalism and American Christianity more broadly. And, and, you know, I, I just kept running up against Christians who were awful and people who were not Christians, or people of no particular faith, who are much more decent people. <laughs> and I mean, this this sounds very trite, but it, it wasn't even like articulated in my mind that much. But at, at some point, I was at this seminar around the study of gender and religion. And I just had this like crisis moment of just like, what, how, how, how do you even make sense of this? And I spent that day just wrestling with it and feeling completely isolated and in this you know, totally empty dorm room, summer turb kind of thing. And, and then just being filled with this real sense of peace and certainty, right? So supernatural, I don't know, um, of it really doesn't matter, right? None of that matters. 
that and what I think about it doesn't even matter, but I, um, I belong to God, right? So there's some of my confessional stuff, you know, you're not alone, but beyond, uh, belong, uh, to in body and soul to my faithful savior, Jesus Christ, right? That that's like the, the head knowledge I had, but I just had such a profound sense of, you know, question all you want. The certainty isn't inside of me. It's not in my thinking it through. It's not, it, it's the certainty's out there and I'm held in that. And so it, it was a religious experience, I guess. And it just let me not stress and just live in that faith and continue to explore that without depending, making my faith depend on the actions of people who are professing the same things that I was professing. Uh, not not to betray your Calvinist heritage, but it sounds awfully Methodist that you had this <laughs> you know? moment where your heart was strangely warmed, right? I, right, exactly, exactly. And, and I will say, you know, one thing that graduate school did, study in American religion, was it introduced me to all these other traditions right. where I had really been raised that, you know, Dutch Calvinism, this is the... Not just the best; it really is. It's the only way, and uh, and and, the, and you know everybody kind of whatever tradition you're raised in. I think you get a, a dose of that, but we, you know, I certainly had a bit of arrogance. Have a bit of arrogance around that. We're smarter. We're better uh, than other Christians, and um, and I, I I still love the tradition. It has absolutely made me who I am. The intellectual um, tradition and this kind of all of life reformed perspective, um, biblical, all of that makes me who I am. But uh, yeah, I also learned about Methodism and I loved that. And I love the kind of different sources of authority within Methodism. And I love this longer Methodist history, of particularly women's history. I loved what I was learning about the Adventist tradition and just many other um, kind of strands that growing up, I just been taught what's wrong about these, if I even knew that they existed. And then in graduate school, I, I, I got to explore kind of on their own terms and see how much beauty there was and how much other traditions had to offer and maybe point out some blind spots in my own. Uh, so going back to, to your story as a, as a grad student, um, I think a lot of people are going to resonate with what you shared. I do, certainly, where you spent essentially your professional life looking at church history American church history, you've written Jesus and John Wayne, a lot of us have read it, and and it can be very dismaying to see the hypocrisy and the departure from the way of Jesus that has infiltrated so much of the people who claim his name, and yet you came to a place of putting all that aside and still somehow grounding your faith in Christ, not dismantling it just because of all the hypocrisy you saw all around you. Um, it sounds like that prepared you for the scholarship you are still doing, that you're able to look at these less savory parts of the church, and it somehow doesn't destroy your own faith? I, I think it really has. And and I, I should clarify that I didn't set out to write a book about the dark side of American right. evangelicalism or American Christianity. I was, I was fascinated by you know, how I saw evangelicals talking about Christian masculinity in the, you know, uh, in the early 2000s. And, and so I thought, I want to understand this better. And one thing led to another and it ended up, you know, a, a fairly critical take on, um, on some of these kind of dominant strands of American evangelicalism. So uh, inadvertently then, yes, this, this understanding, I think, I think a couple of things really helped me not f actually have any crisis of faith while writing that book. One is I you know, always had this primary identity outside of mainstream evangelicalism, this Dutch Calvinism, which, you know, certainly we have our flaws and <laughs> we have a theology to explain our flaws. But, you know, that so the the culture I was describing, the people I was writing about, almost none of them had been part of my religious upbringing and certainly were not kind of bedrock to my own faith commitment at all. So I didn't have that personal, many of my readers really have to, you know, this is kind of the dis, uh, deconstruction narrative, have to separate out now their core faith from all of this. I, I just haven't had to do that in the same way. I could probably stand to do a bit more of that in my own tradition. Um, so I had that distance. And um, and then, yeah, I, I did have this sense of knowing that that I had this personal distance, but then also as a historian, right? You just know that there are so many iterations 
of, you know, Christianity in any moment and throughout world history, some better, some much worse. Like there, there's a lot here. You just have to have an understanding that just the, to profess Christ or to claim Christ's power does not equal, you know, following Christ. And again, I have a theology that explains this <laughs> of sin, of depravity, of human pride. And of course, that is going to ref, uh, kind of, kind of re- reflect, be reflected in religious spaces too. So sometimes, you know, reform folks are credited with this idea of an antithesis. You know, the world is divided between good and evil, and and you're either with God or you're against God. And but you can see that manifest in a variety of ways. In my corner of the tradition, it was, and that runs through all of us, all of us, right. including and even especially people who profess Christ and religious power structures. So with that framework, I just have never had this um, crisis in, I just felt I had to tell the truth. And that's what I tried to do in my scholarship. And I think we have to start there. Then how we process that, how we respond to that, we have to start with the truth. Yeah, well, there's a reason why we did not title this series, Why Are You Still an Evangelical? We're calling it, why are you still a Christian? Because yeah, there is a difference. And having that little bit of distance from the stuff you are writing about probably helps. Um, But you're right. Your Reformed tradition gives you the framework and tools and theologies for understanding why the label alone doesn't always bring with it the consistency. Uh, Which leads to our second question then. What do you find difficult about still being a Christian today? I mean, you were raised in this faith. Um... You've been through different eras. You're old enough. We're about the same age. You're old enough to have experienced this in different settings and places. What do you find particularly challenging about still being a Christian today? You know, honestly, sometimes it's exhausting to have to prove myself to other Christians that, that mm. I'm a Christian, which is um, it, it's just not something that I um, I prioritize that much. It's something like, okay, I get dragged into these situations and, you know, you can say what you want about me or make the claims and call me a wolf or a heretic or a false teacher, you know, all day long. But, uh, or or recently I saw somebody um, do a thread about me about how, you know, I wasn't a Calvinist because look at, you know, what Calvin said about women and there's no possible way that, you know, you're a Calvinist because do you agree with this, this, and this, and this? And I'm like, well, I also don't agree with executing my, uh, you know, theological (laughs) combatants here, which is actually good for you, but uh, (laughs) not you, him, Uh, right? You know, so uh, in that, it just really struck me as, you know, what is, what is Christianity to you? What is Calvinism? What, what is this whole thing? Is it just checking off certain boxes, right? Ascribing to perfectly articulated statements of faith. And if that's the case, I'm just going to say 99% of American Christians are out, I mean, if we really want to get serious, you know, let, let's look at theories of the atonement, if you will. Let's, let's look at who is Jesus, right? We've got some survey data on that, even in evangelical spaces. A lot of people somehow miss the fact that, you know, Jesus is God. And so, so I mean, but there, there's just a whole lot of, you, you, you can keep getting finer and finer in terms of your um, doctrinal checklist. And as you do, like, nobody's going to qualify. But at a certain point, I mean, to get back to this, like, you're not a Calvinist line of attack, which to me is like, okay, I guess, you know, just, I guess I'm just a really bad Calvinist and I'm fine with that. But it, it it's not this checklist. It's not, do you a- ascribe to particular um, carefully worded statements, right? To me, even if I differ with Calvin on a number of different points, I can't change the fact that I was steeped in his teachings for my entire life. The most formative class that I ever took was an entire course around Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. All right, I have the two volumes that, like that, to me as I as I read that, I lived into it. I was like, yes, this, this is what I've always believed. But now I understand what I believe, and that has just been so formative. Right, the whole framework of a of the way you approach faith, what faith is to me, all of that 
is, you know, that's where I grew up into this faith. That's, that's, that's who I am. It's my identity, whether I can check all of the boxes or not, right? So it's just a different understanding of religion. And here too, religious scholarship helps me because in religious studies, <laughs> there's all kinds of writing that shows how Protestants in particular, and then evangelicals especially, define faith very differently than most other religious folks do, including other Christians, now and through world history, right? We like those little words, statements, checklists, affirmations. Is that, is that because our traditions have typically come out of, well, obviously Protestantism, but European Enlightenment yep. modernism, which is very... Yep, yep. European Enlightenment modernism. You can have also uh, then this particular individualism and right. then really a kind of, I think we could say Arminianism thrown in. And, you know, you can just kind of add it all in. But this kind of, so it's individual rather than communal. It's statements rather than identity or certainly praxis in many cases. And uh, it's it's just a very, very thin understanding of what it means to be a person of faith, right? And so just having that head knowledge and that broader perspective, it comes in really handy when people do try to attack my faith uh, it, because it just doesn't get under my skin. I know where they're coming from. I know what they're trying to do, but it's so, just tiring. Yeah. And I guess that's what's maybe changed over the last few decades, especially with social media. There's just now yeah. more people who are constantly <laughs> challenging yes. the, the authenticity and purity of your faith based on doctrinal beliefs. We on a recent episode, uh, Phil Caitlin and I were talking about, I think the term was purity death spirals. Yes. Where and, and purity meaning doctrinal purity or belief purity yes, that if you, yes. you you might agree with me on ninety nine point nine percent of stuff but there's this one thing where we differ and that's it you're out and exactly it seems like social media is primed to do that kind of sorting right right because you're no longer kind of accountable to your actual religious communities social media opens up every religious community to outside accountability outside, like across the spectrum, right? And there's some, some, some of that is really healthy, right? I'm one of those accountability people that will go into other spaces sometimes and be like, well, wait just a minute, right? You know, so this is just the way the world works. Uh, but what that does mean is that, is that there is, you, you really cannot please everybody. <laughs> there's always going to be somebody, you know, weighing in, you know, in, in my case, sometimes trying to get me fired, uh, you know, starting campaigns to get me fired, uh, you know, calling me out, all, you know, in, into their spaces and getting all their followers to pile on and call me wolf and false teacher and enemy and all these things, you know. Um, so that's just part of the world we live in. And so I think it's just important to know how this works and um, and, and to not let yourself be defined on their terms. I, I, mean, I have watched you from a distance on social media interact or choose not to interact with some of those voices. And from what I can tell, I think you've you've managed yourself really honorably and and maturely in that. But given your earlier responses to why you're still a Christian, it's clear that you've done that self-differentiating work of, of being secure in your your place with Christ and not rooting at all what other people think of you or even the the legitimacy or hypocrisy of communities you've seen. You you've got that grounding. It makes me wonder what about that younger person perhaps? who is a high school student, a college student, who hasn't gotten to that point of real security in their faith yet, and they're facing the social media. I mean, they may not be a, a celebrity historian writer like you, but they're being criticized by the general mob that exists out there. What advice do you have for them in this era of how do you continue to grow in your faith and not succumb to all the criticism and this purity death spiral attitude that is out there. I mean, it's brutal. It is really brutal. Um, I think it depends on the person and the circumstances. And for me, you know, in addition to kind of being grounded and, and being older, so having some experience before I entered the 
social media space, you know, we had a life before. I remember when email was invented, you know, um, so I'm that old, which is really helpful in some ways. Um, and then also I have a hard time knowing which cords to plug in here, you know, sometimes too, but so pros and cons. But, but for people who are kind of exploring their faith, I hope you have a really thick skin if you're going to explore that um, online. And I, and I mean that seriously. I, it turns out I do have a very thick skin. Right? In addition to being grounded, I also just temperamentally, like, I just don't really care all that much. It, it takes a lot to get under my skin. And really the times where I do speak out are to, to correct the record. Like, call me what you will, but, you know, I'm a... a confessional Christian. I profess the Nicene Creed. I do all these things. I'm an active church member. So, you know, every once in a while, I'll just be like setting the record straight, you know, or, and I will call out dehumanizing language, whether it's theological or not. So wolf, that sort of thing, because I, I'm, I'm also, you know, a scholar of authoritarianism. And uh, frankly, um, I've, I've done some work in genocide studies. And that is where I, I will call that out all the time. And I don't care if they're quoting a Bible verse at me or not. I'm just going to call that out. So those are that's when I will speak out, really. For for those young folks um, or new Christians, you know, maybe maybe don't explore online if it's, <laughs> if it's too rough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the on the flip side is you meet so many incredible people that you can you know engage in conversation and you will find so many supportive people so I, I guess mute uh, and uh, block if need be and it really really depends on the person and if you find that it is kind of crushing you and if you're if you're kind of wincing and and flinching then then maybe take a different approach if there there are other folks for whom that's really invigorating and in, in that case just you know go for it i i'm really bad at giving advice because i just think there are all kinds of ways to go about doing this this episode is being sponsored by ag1 by athletic greens some of you know that my dad is a doctor and as i get older he's always telling me to watch my weight and exercise regularly but in the last few years, he's also been telling me to pay attention to my gut health. He's been persuaded by all the research saying that the biome of good bacteria that lives in our guts is critical to our long-term health. There's just one problem. I hate taking lots of pills and vitamins and supplements. And why do they always have to be so big? That's one of the reasons I was excited to try AG1 by Athletic Greens. AG1 is a foundational nutritional drink with 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food ingredients. I take it first thing in the morning before I've had my tea and before I jump into my morning routine of writing my daily devotional. And I'll be honest, it tasted way better than I expected. I've been doing it for a few weeks now and I feel great knowing I'm supporting my health and not having to gag down a bunch of giant pills every morning. And that's why I've stuck with it because AG1 is a super easy daily habit. So, if you're looking for a simpler and cost-effective supplement routine, check out AG1 by Athletic Greens. And right now, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash holypost. That's athleticgreens.com slash holypost. Well, in the, in the vein of giving advice, third question what is helping you most be a Christian today? Two things there. One, where I was just kind of going in, in the conversation is as much as I get attacked online, and sometimes not on, in, online, but, you know, it's real and, and, and it gets some attention and people see that and they feel sorry for me. And I just, you know, want to tell people, you have no idea. This is just such a tiny, tiny uh, percent of my actual engagement with people. So much of it is incredibly positive and beautiful and heartfelt and poignant. Uh, fellow believers, people from different faith traditions, people from no particular faith traditions, the conversations that I've been invited into and the relationships that I've formed with people on social media, I just, I only know their handle. I mean, I don't even, you know, um, sometimes I meet them in person and it's like, we know each other, right? And that connection is real. And so I have found actually social media, and I know there's a downside with echo chambers and so on when you just surround yourself with people who think like you, but I try not to surround myself with people who think like me, but good, decent people who help me think better. 
those are the people that I follow. Those are the people I kind of seek out. And so my social media space and my networks now in real life are just filled with really incredible people. And it's those relationships and what I'm not just like how they interact with me, what I'm seeing them do in their spaces, their courage, their um, the, the, the costs that they're bearing, their testimonies, that is a daily hourly source of encouragement to me. So, so, so that's one thing that I would say. And then the other thing, absolutely. It's my local church. I belong to a, just a remarkable Christian reformed church just down the street from Calvin and down the street, the other direction from my home. And it's beautiful. It is a, a kind of liturgical, confessional community. We have an all-nation service that draws in people from around the world, refugees, immigrants, uh, and we have a standard English service. It's just an incredible, beautiful place. And sometimes I, I'm, I'm always hesitant to share about my church uh, in specific terms because I don't want to make things harder for them. Uh, but I do sometimes share links to sermons online because it, it, it is so beautiful. I go to Church of the Servant here in Grand Rapids, I have two amazing pastors, Andrew Mead and Karen Campbell, and and I have an amazing community there, right? And that that's the most grounding thing. So whatever's happening on Twitter, there's actually like this little group of us who found each other at church who all happen to be on Twitter, right? So we have this Twitter reality. The vast majority of people at any Sunday, like just yesterday, it just turned out that like the, the few of us at the back of the sanctuary that were the stragglers, we looked around and like, oh, we're all the Twitter people, right? So, so we have this all, this common world that we can, you know, engage in real life about, but the vast majority of people at church, right, have no idea that this all exists. And so it's been a lovely space for me to be grounded in my faith. Um, uh, Pastor Karen is uh, from Northern Ireland. Ireland. And so she brings this perspective of, you know, a kind of global perspective and um, really interesting perspectives on, you know, religious nationalism and violence and healing and restoration. Mm. So it's just been a absolutely life-giving space. And, and then I would say, um, you know, Calvin is an extension of that. My colleagues here, my students, uh, you know, we usually make the news when there's something controversial happening, uh, and and usually uh, whatever it is is either going to anger the left or the right, or often we have a knack for doing both at the same time. <laughs> and uh, but you know, the act, my experience of Calvin, right, that's part of it. But it really is just amazing colleagues uh, who share in this faith, share in this mission, and and so my real life is very. Um, I, I have. It's it's very much kind of uh, I, I'm living in in community in a faith community and I want to say this as okay this is my story and so it, it it grieves me when I I meet so many people who are isolated right I know that this is I know how how <laughs> to use an evangelical word how blessed I am in this and not everybody has this and it's really hard to find in some places or to create. And, and so I just want to say that, you know, that's not advice of even go find it because sometimes, you know, it's just it, it's, it's not necessarily out there or maybe it is, but it's, it's hard to find. I, I'm assuming as we get further into the series, asking different folks these questions, we're going to hear a lot about community and incarnate relationships and churches is going to be a big factor here. Um, I, let me make an assumption. I'm, I know that you and your colleagues at Calvin don't always agree on everything. I'm assuming that you and your brothers and sisters at your local church don't always agree on everything. So what does healthy community look like for you where it's not predicated on always agreeing? Yeah. yeah. You know, I, for me, it actually looks like surfacing our disagreements. Um, I, especially with my colleagues, you know, I think that there's a bit of a culture here, it's fair to say, of, um, you know, being really kind of Midwestern nice mm -hmm. and and not confronting some of these differences. I would rather know where my colleagues stand on certain things, have it out, <laughs> explore, you know, just how how deep that 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 divide runs. Sometimes it doesn't run all that deep. Sometimes it does. But I would much rather just 
walk that path and have that conversation with mutual respect, with honesty, with integrity. And then on the other side of it, you're fine, right? You're, you're not letting things fester or brew or you're not like suspecting that they don't think I belong here or that they actually think this or, you know, or they're off doing this. You just have the conversations and you can do that much more easily when you've, when you know each other and when you've right. been around and then, and then you can know like, okay, you know, and, and I know they know me. So they might not like what I say about this particular thing, but they also know that's just a small piece of who I am and what I contribute both to this community and more broadly. And so I think that there's just much more mutual respect. You know, it's this, this what did you call it? This kind of purity death spiral, right? Where you're like narrower and narrower terms and, oh, I found a thing that we disagree on. So you're dead to me, you know, and, and you must be punished and held up as an example, right? That kind of thing, right? When you, when you know people at this deeper level, you know, your focus is more, you're reminded more of the, the 99% or the 90% or the 72% that you do share in common. And then hopefully too, right, when you respect your colleagues, sometimes they might be right. And sometimes they might have a point and they can help you see that you need to refine your thinking or maybe even change. And so it really helps to engage not with the kind of worst of the other side, not with the most extreme guys out there. Sorry to be gender specific, but uh, to to engage with the the best who hold different views, right. and that is really helpful for me. Actually, that's like a kind of intellectual discipline, if not a spiritual discipline, to pay special attention to the people who are slightly to my right, people that I respect immensely. And then I let them kind of speak into my thinking, whether they know it or not. I have this whole collection of people that I kind of follow. Some I actually know in person now, um, you know, people who make me uncomfortable and who annoy me in good ways. Right. Because if they're yeah, there's yeah. The people who annoy me because they're just annoying and we don't have to name names, but we're all thinking of the same people. But then there's um, you know, people who annoy me because oh, they're kind of getting under my skin because I think they might have a point. Right. Uh, was it Henry Nowen? I think I, I think it was Henry Nowen who said community is where the person you like least always is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a great point. I, one of the things I hear frequently from Holy Post listeners who you mentioned folks who feel alone and isolated, don't have good community, and they're lo- they call themselves spiritually homeless, is some of them, not all of them, but some of them are looking for a community of people that agree 90, 95, 99% with all their views and they can't find it. And I'm going, I can't find that either. You're not going to find it. And at some point we have to figure out what what's a minimum amount of doctrinal agreement we maybe need to share to be in community together. But then all the other stuff, how do we learn to be healthy in our disagreement? Yeah. And, and that's what you're talking about is being open about it, uh, being honest about where those differences and then discovering that maybe they're not as deep as we had suspected, or maybe I'm just going to come to learn to respect those who I disagree with because I've been characterizing the worst yeah. way of understanding their view rather than the best way of understanding it. And uh, it sounds like yeah. you're modeling that really well. You know, there, there, and there are like issues that are points of, you know, conflict, but then, then there are demeanors, I think, too. Right. And, and this is tough, though, because there's a lot of talk these days of, you know, kind of uh, uh, spiritual abuse or religious trauma. And I want to respect that while also acknowledging I'm, I'm so Gen X, you know, so like we, we don't do self-care. Right. We don't do all this stuff. You know, we just, you know, tough it out. So I'm not the best person to speak into this. But in my in my own experience, you know, I joined a church when I came to Grand Rapids that uh, was essentially complementarian. Uh, no offices were open to women. And I joined that church because it was multiracial and bilingual, right? And so I thought if if folks from you know other backgrounds are coming into a predominantly white space, they're going to be uncomfortable and they're going to be paying <laughs> paying a price, right? So what? So I have to set this part aside. I think I felt called into that, um, and and it was such a formative experience. Eventually, the church ended up closing down. It was a lot to ch- you know, it's a challenge to hold together across so many differences. But it was yeah. a, it was the first ten years of my time here in Grand Rapids, and then after that, I ended up joining a church that um, was you know what we call egalitarian. I, I I kind of resist these 
like simplistic, um, but you know, all offices open to women which at that point was incredibly refreshing. I didn't feel like I had to apologize for not being a stay at home mom. I didn't feel like I, you know, it was really good for me in that moment of my life. And I could handle, you know, different people are in different places. And to get back to your point, yes, there's no church that's going to be hundred percent matched to who you are. And there's different levels of resiliency given where people have been in their journeys in terms of what issues are actually really important to them, right? There have been times where I could be in spaces where I'm really up again, you know, like on my own and and, and, and have a lot of differences in my church community. Honestly, right now, it's it's been a, a, a blessing to me to be in a church that where I don't have to always kind of, you know, prepare myself to be judged for who I am and what I do. Um, so there's different ways of going about this. I absolutely love though communities that can hold together across some pretty big differences, theologically, socially, culturally, politically, those are my favorite spaces. And man, when you can do that, you, you feel the bonds, right? You feel the bonds because you have to hold together. And what you're doing is you're holding together, not just for the fun of it, but because you are confident that you're rooted in something much deeper, right? Centered around Christ, which gives us the humility that any of us could be wrong here, but we're all going to confidently claim to the thing that we hope uh, above hope that we aren't wrong about. Indeed. Well, Kristen, I've benefited greatly from your scholarship and your writing, and you've shared that broadly. You've gotten criticized for it at times, but I'm grateful that you were willing to open up more personally and share some of your own story and development as a Christian. And I'm grateful that you are still a Christian for sure, and grateful you're continuing to do really good work. And I'm excited to see what comes next. So thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. And yeah, I hope that this is helpful to your guests. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Mike Stralo. Editing by Area Code Audio. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by subscribing to Holy Post Plus at holypost.com slash plus. Also, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.